expressed in the prayer by Brother Bowl, we have seen a lot of different catastrophes that have happened in the last few months, in the last few years that are extraordinary. It's for we coming at uh, difficult times in people's lives. A Puerto Rican people get over one hurricane, another one comes right behind it. And we look at all those disasters that happen, and sometimes they are extraordinary, that we lose 3,000 Americans in a, a tragedy in New York City in 9-11. And we think about what does that mean? And I remember certain religious people saying that, that indeed God is paying us back for all the evil that we've done in America. I remember being going on vacation with my mom and dad. They may not remember this and realize young children's memories, they may be off, but I remember somebody hiding my eyes as we went through Bourbon Street in New Orleans on a vacation. I don't know if it was my dad or my mom, but I, why did they do that? Well, there's some place, things that the boy didn't need to be seeing as they walked through uh, the town. But I remember when the hurricanes came and the floods came upon New Orleans, Bourbon Street was surviving. What does that do with your theory? If there was a place where there was much sin and much ungodliness taking place, why didn't he just use that hurricane, just wipe them off the face of the earth? They're the ones that didn't get flooded. So our theories sometime about why things happen indeed are, are different. And I think sometimes different than the way God would like us to think. And to help us understand that, we're going to think with Jesus this, more, this evening. And I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Luke the 13th chapter. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Luke 13, 1 through 5. And follow with me in your Bibles, please. Now there were some present at that very season who told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said unto them, Think ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they have suffered these things? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all in likewise or like manner perish. Are those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Think ye that they were offenders above all, the men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So what we observe is that Jesus two times says, unless, American, New American Standard, unless ye repent, or except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Says it twice. And the point is being asked, and there's the sense of where Jesus knew that these people's minds were set. They talk about these Galileans. And their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. Were they greater sinners than all the Galileans? Yeah, because that. look at what happened at their time of when they're offering their sacrifices. God was showing their bunch of hypocrites. And God, God, would, God, God punished them. A lot of people would think that. That's a horrible occasion. It'd be like someone coming and cutting our throats and putting it in the Lord's Supper cups. We're remembering Jesus' sacrifice. And that would be a horrible thing. Will we be more sinners than all the other Christians? In Pasadena? Oh, some would say that. Some would think that. But Jesus said, no, that's not true. What about that tower? 18 people. That tower that fell upon those, those people. New American Standard, are they more culprits? Have they done something really evil to get such a horrible end? That's the way men think. That's the way they're thinking. Jesus says, that's not true either. But he says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And I want us to see what was Jesus thinking about. I know what men are thinking about. And men will come up with different signs. Remember, 
the barbarians who do not speak the Greek, they were indeed foreign and to the, the Greek language on the island of Melita in Acts the 28th chapter. When Paul put his hand in the fire as he's picking up sticks and put them on there, a, a poisonous serpent latched hold to his hand and they said, oh, he's a murderer. Because that snake has latched on his hand. He's a murderer. He escaped the sea, but he can't escape justice. God's delivering justice. He's a murderer. And when Paul didn't immediately drop dead, and when Paul's hand was not even swollen, they said, he is a god. They missed it in both camps, didn't they? He's not a god, and he wasn't a murderer. So much for your thoughts about how things work in this world. If he'd have dropped dead, it's already well, not a god. He's a, he's a murderer. But that would have been wrong too. But we can come up with our thoughts that the chickens have come home to roost on America because of all the things that have happened to us. Jesus wouldn't think that way. But what he does do, he takes us in another area of thought that I'd like to, to share with you. And I'm going to, we're going to explore this and realize, first of all, what Jesus is doing Man is looking at the extraordinary end of these people, of, of Tower and Siloam falling upon them. While they're worshiping, their, their, their blood is mingled, the Galileans, their blood is mingled with their sacrifices. And man, are, they are looking at the extraordinary end. This is so different and extraordinary. There must be some meaning to that. God is working something extraordinary to bring home a message. Jesus said, that's not the way to look at it. Jesus is looking at ordinary sin. Because notice how he uses the word all. I know it's limited by context, but let's limit it by context. Notice what he says about, and uses the word all. That he says in verse 2, Unto think ye that these Galileans are sinners above all the Galileans because they've suffered these things? He doesn't put just a few. He puts all the Galileans in there. Do you think that these indeed are sinners above, that they got this extraordinary judgment upon them, that all the Galileans, he includes them all? I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all and likewise perish. You're all going to perish if you don't repent. Are those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, think ye that they were offenders above all the men that dwell in Jerusalem? Notice the word all. I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye should all likewise perish. That's encompassing everybody. And so I need to understand, Jesus is looking at where sin leads people if they do not repent. All shall perish unless they repent. That's what the Bible teaches. In Romans the third chapter in verse 10 we read about Jews and Greeks and you can't be anything else. You're going to be a Gentile or you're a Jew as we see here in the New Testament. And he says what then are we better than they? No we in no wise for we before laid the charge that that both of Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. All under sin. As is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. All is in, has the context. No, not one. We're all under sin. When we sin, we find that ourselves all under sin and everybody has sinned. We see that in the same chapter. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only remedy in this context is the blood of Christ and our faith in the blood of Christ. And here, here Jesus says repentance is necessary. So when he uses that, I think he's looking at everybody's sin. is going to lead us to perishing. 
if we do not repent. That's the first ingredient. Well, I guess still got some problems. He said, you know, in like manner, you all likewise will perish. And that's very true. We'll all be murdered. He said, all likewise perish. All in same manner perish. And this is what confuses sometimes. Was Jesus said, well, all we'll do that. Well, they're all going to be, to be murdered and their blood mixed with their sacrifices. Well, in the same context, Jesus says, that's not what I'm thinking about. That may be what you're thinking about. Maybe what I think about. Because he offers another illustration. A wall, a tower falling upon people. That was different than their blood mingled with their sacrifices. And he says, you all likewise, likewise, in like manner, shall perish. Not going to die the same way. I've had trouble with this passage using that to tell people that they need to repent in order to have the remission of their sins. And because I'm thinking of spiritual death and the context is talking about a physical death. And I've had trouble say, well, I don't think I can use that, that passage to talk about either, uh, you know, re repent or perish. And yet we find it in a lot of Bible helps when we're trying to teach people the gospel. Use Luke 13, 3. Use Luke 13, 5. I said, no, that, this is talking about dying physically. And we're, we need to repent or we're going to perish uh, uh, spiritually. And, that's, and I said, well, this must not be talking about that. But sometimes I thought, well, how did, what is Jesus talking about here that might lend me to physical death? That all, if they don't repent, will involve with physical death. I think, well, he talks about Jerusalem. The tower of Siloam fell upon them. You think all that are not in Jerusalem going to, you know, there these greater sinners that all that are in Jerusalem? No, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You're going to perish physically, and destruction of Jerusalem would come upon them if they did not change, and they did not repent, and it happened because they weren't. So as this passage, I'm going to use it holding to my physical and spiritual Dif distinction. Well, it, it, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem because he brings in Jerusalem. But I don't think that's true either. We speak about perishing. Does sometimes does it mean physical death? Is it used that way in the New Testament? In Matthew the eighth chapter, the disciples of Jesus were involved in. Traveling with Jesus, they were on the Sea of, of Galilee, and a storm arose, and they were afraid. In verse 24, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save, Lord, we perish. We're in the context of being in a boat. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. And he's not worried about things. But here comes water in the boat. I get worried. and We're going to perish. Did they, oh, we're going to go to hell. We're going to, we're going to lose our, our spiritual, uh, eternal life with you. Oh, God, I don't think they were talking about that. They were thinking about physical death. Sometimes that word perish can be connected with merely physical death. As we see in Luke the 13th chapter. But a lot more times we find it's dealing with eternal destruction. That eternal separation from God. That spiritual part of man. That we find that is a reality. And I think Jesus wants us to see that. Look at these passages in John 3 and verse 16 about perishing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, should not perish, but have eternal life. That tells me there's a distinction between eternal life and perishing. We're talking about the, the, the eternal life, that spiritual connection with God forevermore. And indeed, Perishing is the, the contrast, it's the it's antipathy of that. Uh, if, if I don't have eternal life, I'm going to perish. 
unless I, I repent. First John, the 10th chapter, and verse 28, shows the power that the Father has to keep us from falling. No one can take God's people out of, out of his, out his hand. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. The Bible here is speaking about people of God that are acting like sheep. The sheep hear the shepherd's voice. It's those people that will never perish because they keep hearing the voice of Jesus. If we keep hearing the voice of Jesus, no one can take us out of the hand of the Father. And that's the context. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Remember what Jesus says in John the 11th chapter when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's the next page over in my Bible. And he makes this statement. He that believeth on me, though he die, yet shall he live. I believe on him, and I'm going to die physically, and yet I shall live. He is the resurrection and the life. But listen to this. Whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. He's talking about the spiritual life. We have eternal life when we become Christians. And if we keep on believing, we keep on hearing his voice, we keep on following Jesus as sheep, no one can take us out of the hand of, of the God. And we will never perish. We will never die. We will have that eternal life forever and ever. We're talking about the glorified state of the Christian, which is more than just dying physically. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, it's not just Jesus that speaks this way, but inspired <laughs> apostles like Paul speaks about the gospel and those who reject it and those who look upon it as the power of God. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, For the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. It's the context of spiritual salvation. It's the, the gospel is the power of God to salvation, not salvation from a falling building, not salvation from murder, not salvation from hurricanes or earthquakes. Salvation from our sins. And realize that perishing is a dichotomy of that. It's that, it's that which is an antithesis of that, that we find taking place in the context. It is the power of God. But to them that perish, they're not going to hold on to that word. They're not going to come to that word. And they indeed will perish. And a final example I give along those lines is 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 18. When the essentiality of Jesus' resurrection for our benefit, our eternal benefit, is being emphasized. Jesus could have died, and he did. And... We could remember his great teaching, but God did not place how we're supposed to think about Jesus just on his death. Yes, through his death, he shed his blood, we could have the forgiveness of our sins. But what happens if he were never raised? Paul helps us understand what that means. When he says, we start back up to verse 17, if Christ hath not been raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. Then they also that are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Perished for eternity. They don't have eternal life. If we've only hoped in Christ in this life, we're of all men most pitiable. We are to be pity. We're objects of pity. That indeed we really have perished in our sins. We have no hope of eternal life, the resurrection from the dead. That's, that's how God puts it. And what we're observing here is the fact he had to be raised. I, I'm going to perish in my sins. I'm going to die in my sins. 
if Jesus was not raised, even though he died. And you can say he died for me. But if he were not raised, I'm indeed a man most pitiable. I'm just reminded we can make the, the wager that a mathematician did one time and his apology and his teaching of Jesus Christ. And I know with some people it might work. But I'll make a wager with you and I'll wage my life that if I am, if you are wrong about Jesus and there is hell, there is a judgment to come. You're in trouble when you deny the Lord. But if I die and I'm never raised from the dead, then I won't know anything. So the wise move to make in your life, dear sinner, is that you believe in Jesus. Because if there is a judgment and we're raised from the dead, you're in trouble when you refuse to acknowledge Jesus. I won't know anything about it. Now that might sound good to people. Say, so, well, I'll just, what is the best, what's the law of averages? I probably need to go this route. If that's why you go with Jesus, I think you're a man most pitiable. If I've only hoped in Christ in this life, and when I die, there's nothing future for me, God, the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, says, I am a man most pitiable. He didn't place that on, on the idea of what are the averages and what would be a great wager to make in your life. It's based upon a fact. And it's on a miracle. That's how God does things. And there'll be people that reject it and they're going to perish. So I think he's speaking about the eternal separation from God. In eternity, we will perish unless we indeed repent. Now, let me just stop here. If he said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I know we're not going to all have the catastrophe, but if we're talking about physical death, and this is what makes me change my, my thinking, what I've thought in the past. If I'm speaking about physical death, I repented of my sins. I became a Christian. Will I die physically? Yes. In fact, all will. Unless you know, the Lord comes and we're changed in that moment, twinkle of an eye. We're, we're going to return to the dust. So I know he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about perishing. But he says you likewise will perish. He wasn't talking about your blood mixed with the Galileans because he talked about a tower falling upon people too. So what is he talking about? All sinners are going to meet an unexpected end of perishing eternally if they do not repent. Were these people expecting that their blood will be mingled with their sacrifices that day? Well, probably not. A tower of Siloam falling down? The twin towers in New York falling down? I'll be leaping out of a window because I don't have much of a choice. All the catastrophes that come. Surely I missed one hurricane. It's not going to come a few days later. And this is stronger than the other one. Jesus is looking at what is more important than thinking about the extraordinary end that people come to. I got a book entitled They Went That Away. It's, it's a book of how people died. And it's, it's by a secular writer. He thought that was interesting. And it's interesting how the different ways people have died that are famous. Crazy ways people die. But Jesus is not looking at that. He's saying, don't you realize that people are going to come to an end that they do not even imagine is going to take place? These people go and leave this world an extraordinary event you haven't seen what's going to be ahead of everybody. If they do not repent, they're all going to perish when they come to meet me at the judgment seat. And they're unprepared. 
and the world's not prepared for it this hour. Whoa, he drowned in 18 foot of water trying to save people's lives. What does that mean? Was he a sinner? <laughs> Jesus is wanting us to see something that's greater. Remember in John 9, when here's a man that's been born blind? And the question was asked, who is the sinner? Was he the sinner before he was born? Or were his parents the sinner? Something had to be wrong for him to be born blind. He said neither. Neither. What this has happened is that the work of God might be made manifest in him. The work of God might be made manifest in him. It's that God is about to work a miracle in him. He's taken this on something that is more important than your little theories when bad things happen to people. That there must have been something really bad in their life for that to happen. Jesus did that in John 9. I think he's doing it in Luke 13 as well. He's taking us to a judgment that people are not prepared for. And it is a spiritual reality that we're going to be united back to our bodies. And we're going to meet the Lord in judgment. And that we will go to eternity in heaven or in hell. And the world is not prepared for that. And Jesus wanted to get people thinking, not in the channel, oh, this was an extraordinary event. There must, it must have great meaning. No, he's looking at ordinary sin and what's in store for everyone that does not repent. I want to make a little application. The lesson will be yours. We should warn all about what is ahead of them. Because they don't know it's coming. Tower falling. Murder while you're worshiping. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 10 and 11. Apostle Paul helps us understand this. That whether he was in his body or home with the Lord, he, he always made it his aim. That means his love and his purpose in life was to be well-pleasing unto him. For we must all be made manifest. Before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or evil. Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We want them to know what's ahead of them. So they will reverence the Lord. Follow him as shepherd. And be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Instead of beating him as judge unprepared because we did not repent in the route that we were going. Luke, the 12th chapter, helps us understand the reverence for God because of this judgment and what's ahead. Because in Luke 12, in Luke's account, I say unto you, my friends, as he's speaking to his apostles, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, they have no more what they can do. They can only kill the body. I warn you, I warn you, he says, whom ye shall fear. Fear him who after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Oh, God, don't say that you kill anybody. That's why I lose Luke. He has the power to do that. Jesus doesn't make excuses to be politically correct. After he hath killed, he hath the power to cast into hell. I, yea, I say unto you, fear him. Do you realize you're all going to perish? Except you repent. And what Jesus is telling us to think about is that here is something of reality that's far above, well, extraordinary things. We're interested in that. What do you think about that? Aren't they better, we're sinners than everybody? He said, no, that's the wrong thinking. I'm thinking about ordinary sin and where every sinner is coming to when they meet their Lord. C.S. Lewis made an interesting statement in a context when he's speaking about this subject. 
He says, you've never talked to a mere mortal. Think about that. A mere mortal. Oh, yes, we're going to die. We're subject to die. But we know we're going to either live and have eternal life or we're going to exist in hell forever and ever. And every person we meet is not mere mortal, are they? I don't know what it'll be like to be in a glorified state. But if we were in a glorified state, I think men on here might be willing to worship us in a glorified state if they saw that. It'd be that sublime. But every one of us who are Christians, who will repent and who keep on believing and have eternal life and will never die spiritually, we're going to be in a glorified state. And all the people will be like that. They won't be extraordinary. They will be ordinary, glorified people. But if people were to see that reality here, they would probably worship them as a god. Or if they're going to look at people who do not repent and see what eternal corruption looks like, it'd be a horrible nightmare. But it's reality. And who tells us about it? Jesus does. In Martha 9, chapter verse 43, we read about those that are going to, to hell. They're, they're, they've allowed themselves to stumble and sin. If, if thy hand calls thee to stumble, cut it off. It is good for thee to enter into life maimed, enter into life maimed, rather than having two hands to go into hell unto the unquenchable fire. Fire that's not able to be quenched. It's going forever and ever. If thy foot calls thee to stumble, cut it off. It is good for thee to enter into life halt rather than having two feet to be cast into hell. If thy eye calls thee to stumble, cast it out. It is good for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. Why would the worm die not? What's the imagery there? Because there'll always be something there for them to chew on. There'll be something there that's deteriorating. It's corruption. It's called eternal corruption. And the worm will never die because it's everlasting corruption. I don't know what that looks like. But I want to go there. I don't want to see that. And it would be a nightmare for people to see the reality that's coming. For everyone shall be salted with fire. Why do you salt things? You preserve it. You're going to be preserved in eternal fire that will never be quenched in a body that will never be annihilated. And that's what eternal corruption. It is so horrible that you would do the drastic thing of cutting your hand off, plucking your eye out. It would be drastic things. He's not saying you ought to do that. But you ought to repent. You ought to turn from your ways. Because being separated from God for eternity is to be in hell forevermore. I've known people guys that I've worked with, that if they thought they were going to be raised up to be annihilated, it's like that. Body's going to be raised up from the grave and we're going to go to hell and what hell is, is just everlasting uh, annihilation. I'm going, to, I'm going to be, I'm going to perish and there'll be nothing that we've been talking about that's going to keep on corrupting. I know some guys like that that would choose that rather than be a Christian. They don't want to go to heaven. They don't want to be with God's people. They don't want to be with God's people here. They want to do what they want to do. And if they can live their life doing what they want to do with all their sins and not repent, and if that's what's ahead of them, they will take it. They'll take a little pain for a moment and then be annihilated. They'll go that way. 
but to talk to them about everlasting punishment? Where you're going to exist, not live, but exist for eternity? Cast out into outer darkness? And you're going to still be there? That's a fearful thing. And what's sad to me is that some of our brethren have taken hold of that annihilation theory. That there is no eternal hell. There's no everlasting punishment. The fire is going to extinguish you. And you will be no more. They've taken hold of that. And I think they've taken away a little bit of what Jesus wants us to know that will drive us to try to teach others. We persuade men because we know we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll have to give answer of what we've done in the body. When you speak about outer darkness, one writer in his teaching about there's no eternal hell and fire and, and will people be, be in hell burning forever and ever. He said that outer darkness is like it's like the first of creation. Just outer darkness, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. And yet I read every time, when I read outer darkness from the lips of Jesus, somebody's there. One example in Matthew, the eighth chapter, where, we read, where we're reading about a Jew thinking that we're God's people. And one day, he's going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, and he's left out. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down, Matthew 8 and 11, shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom, the Jews shall be cast forth into the outer darkness where there's nothing, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not nothing. I hear somebody out there and they're grinding their teeth and they're weeping Because they are now experiencing something far greater than the Tower of Siloam falling upon them. And they weren't extraordinary sinners. They were ordinary sinners. Jesus wanted us to look at that. You have never met a mere mortal. That person that checks you out at the grocery store. That person that takes your bill and does your work whatever, you know, interchange of, of money and banking, person that waits on your table at a restaurant, those people are not mere mortals. They're going to eternity. And Jesus wanted us to see, don't be thinking, well, if something really bad happens, then there must be real bad sinners. No, look at the sinner that's going to the judgment unprepared. Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's what Jesus is saying. And finally, what it tells us is that all need the saving gospel. Paul in Thessalonians sets forth that Jesus died for all. Therefore, what? All died. And those that live should no longer live to themselves, but to live for Jesus who died for them. He died for all because all are dead in their sins. And they think, well, I'll just die physically and that's the end. No. It's just the doorway into what is going to be horrifying. And who's going to warn them about that? Well, preaching the gospel of Christ and preaching to the dead the gospel of Christ. We'll do that. But in your life, remember, everybody you meet, will all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. And you know, they weren't extraordinary sinners because something bad happened to them. They died in towers falling or hurricanes. 
or earthquakes or they were covered up with a landslide or a tsunami just wiped them off the face of the earth. They must have been real bad. No. What Jesus wanted to see, they're all ordinary sinners and they're going to be in existence in eternity in hell. Give them an opportunity to be in a glorified state in heaven and to enjoy eternal life. That's what the gospel is all about. And you know how you can be involved in that this week? Invite someone to come to where we meet around the gospel. And they're going to hear lessons that will prick their heart. They'll help them to understand what's ahead of them and give them an opportunity that nobody in this world, the secular world and a lot of people in the religious world, will never talk to them about. Because you know how Jesus thinks. I hope you'll think that way and realize, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And I hope we will think about that with the people we meet this week. If you're outside of Jesus Christ this evening, we want to invite you to come to Christ. You may have been taught and, and convicted of your sin, but also convicted of the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're willing, willing to make that confession tonight. We're here to hear that confession. That's the good confession. We don't want anybody to be lost because we know what's in store for you. And you have an opportunity to, to come to Christ and be saved by his death and his resurrection. To have a living hope in heaven. To latch hold of eternal life that you never have to lose. If you stay faithful to the Lord and keep following Jesus. We offer that avenue to eternity. Why not take it now and obey the gospel as we stand and as we sing?